Wow. Amazing. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Very cool, man. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone, please welcome the Thunder Duo to Dromeo. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you don't know who the Thunder Duo is, we have on the drum kit here, Gabor, Gabor Dornier. He's been a Dromeo before. It's good to have you back. Well, you pleasure. are not only a world-class drummer, you're also a professor at the ICMP in London, and um, you've done some pretty amazing stuff. And you guys haven't checked out his lesson on Dromeo. We have a YouTube version of the one he did live. We also have a whole course inside of Dromeo, uh, so check it out. And beside him, we have world-class percussionist Cornell Horvat. Woo. Yes. Great job, great job. Uh, Cornell is an unbelievable percussionist. He was voted number one percussionist in the world by Rhythm Magazine in 2016, correct? Exactly. It's crazy. You do, you're, you're, you do, and the setup you have there is really cool. We're gonna hear more of that as the lesson goes on, but both you guys have also collectively worked with a, a world-class guitarist, Stanley Jordan. Yeah, we still do, yeah, absolutely. It's a new project, it's a quartet with Stanley and uh, also, um, a Chilean uh, bass player, we have Christian Galvez, who is a world-class player, fantastic. Very cool. Yeah, you guys are killing it. And you guys are the one of the oldest or longest-running percussion drummer duos out there. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we've been friends for over 20 years now with Cornell, and we've been playing as a duo uh, more than 12 years now. I, I, I approached Cornell with the idea of the duo in 2005, in February 2005, that's when we had our first gig. So 12 years and running strong. No kidding, well good for you guys, good for you guys. <laughs> and now you. we have you on Dromeo, which is really cool. The lesson today is on how to play with a percussionist, which I mean, obviously you can see this is a perfect setup for that. Um, but uh, if you guys are here tomorrow, we're gonna be live again, public to everyone who's watching here, tell your friends. We're gonna be live for a performance from Thunder Duo where it's not education, it's just awesome music and uh, rhythm. Playing, yeah, playing. performance, yeah. It's Looking be forward really cool. to that one as well. Check them out. You have a DVD that you released a couple years back. This is available at Hudson Music Digital. You can uh, find it on their website too. And if you want to find out more about Thunder Duo, thunderduo.com, cornellhorvat.com, gabordornier.com. I'll post all the information in the description of this video. Uh, but before we get too far into it, Gabor has given me five pairs of sticks. His signature stick, Vic all right? Firth, yeah. Vic Firth signature stick, really cool. We're gonna give all five of these away to one lucky winner. That's a pretty hefty little bundle there. So once we uh, release this YouTube or video lesson on YouTube, just leave a comment below, it's so simple, and just tell us what you think the best part of this lesson was. And um, we'll randomly select one, and we'll ship you five pairs of, of uh, Vic Firth sticks, Gabor signature model. Okay, so. Huge thanks to these sponsors for helping bring uh, you out here. Zildjian, of course, Tycoon Percussion. We got here, I think, a couple days back, and all of a sudden there was like, I don't know, like 20 boxes of percussion yeah. stuff, which was really cool. Uh, obviously, Remo Heads, thank you so much for helping us out with that. Pearl, Pearl uh, Vic Firth, um, am I missing? Um, yeah, just a couple of little things. I'm also using the great Heart Case products, which is a British company. Right. And these brilliant little um, Sky Gels, which is a uh, little damper pads. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I think that's enough for me talking because I just want to. I just want to hear you guys play more, and I want to hear what you have to say. So, how to play with a percussionist? Well, that's a um, that's a very good question. I think it's a great title, thanks to you, because um, basically what we like to create here is, and also in, in my general uh, teaching, wherever I teach, you know, I, I've been uh, approached since I was seventeen for private lessons, and I always enjoyed. Um, seeing the people grow and learn and play better uh, day by day. But there's one thing that is very important, uh, in my opinion, on top of the uh, technical facilities and being as fast as you can and as smooth as you can, is the musicality. Right. Because uh, my point is that we, we don't want to create bedroom drummers. Mm. Because the, the whole thing of playing music is, is sharing the joy and the, and the enthusiasm and the passion about music now. Right. Music is um, uh, is a is a wonderful things that wonderful thing that helps you through a lot of things, good times and bad times, and um, you know once we we share the stage, uh, suddenly from that moment onwards, you're not alone mm -hmm. on, on a drum kit as a, as a solo performer, and this is this goes for if you just play in a duo, or this goes if you play in a quartet, this goes if you play in a big band, this goes if you play with, uh, I mean, if, through my career, I had fantastic opportunities to play with the rhythm section and an 80-piece classical orchestra. Wow. So, so, yeah. so, you know, whatever you do, you need to know your place in the music for that particular ensemble. Now, when you play with a percussionist, 
to break it down, there's a couple of things that is very important to keep in mind. Um, one thing is the volume, which is the most important thing, because everybody's got their um, sort of comfortable volume to play with. Now, if your comfortable volume goes from here to even louder, mm -hmm. then it's very likely that he's going to break his fingers uh, within the first five minutes because we're just stronger, we're louder with the, with, with, the, uh, with the tools that we have, with the wooden sticks, than if someone plays with their bare hands. So if you're a solo drummer and, and, and you... 20 minutes. 20 minutes? <laughs> yeah. he, he would last probably 20 minutes. Now, when we do like an hour and a half or two hours shows and clinics, then he would kill me after 20 minutes. He would just come in, in you know, yeah. <laughs> not yeah. on my head that, uh, to calm down. So that's one thing because um, I think musically it's very important to be able to play certain things at a different dynamic level and a different speed. Because, you know, very often I find amateur drummers being able to play one thing at a certain uh, volume and a certain um, speed. Okay, so it's very important, like when I was younger, even younger, I mean, of course, because I'm still very young, <laughs> I, I, I used to practice very quietly and very slowly, because that was one thing uh, to clarify, what is it that I'm really doing? What, what is the right hand doing? What is the left foot doing? So I really clarified what is it that I want to I wanna work on? What is it that I want to express with my playing? And what is it um, that I want to clarify? What is it that I want I, I, I want to, uh, as, as a final outcome, to sound like? So when you, when you break it down, you slow it down, you play it quietly. First of all, you can practice for much longer periods of time, because back in the day I had the time. I, I don't have it anymore, but back then I had. And so, so that was, um, the first thing is, uh, that I started working on is, is, is the volume. Now, uh, you can re um, reduce your volume uh, several ways. First of all, try to play much, much, um, much more quietly and also the, the choices that you make in your tools. You probably noticed that when we started this piece, um, there was the, uh, the, um, this amazing melodic instrument that Cornell used, which is originally from Switzerland. Um, this instrument is called the hang drum. Now, the hang drum is the sort of hand-played version of the steel drum. Cornell is going to demonstrate um, this little melody for you, uh, which he wrote, and we titled it the first composition, Hung Samba, after this. And you will probably notice, I'm going to demonstrate the grooves when I'm playing them with the brushes and with the sticks, how, how much quieter that is and how much more flow and how much more, how much more life I can give to Cornell's solo uh, melody um, over this piece. So in order, in order that melody can stand out, if I were playing this groove with the sticks, you would probably hear something like... The melody would not come out right. uh, you know, as clearly and, and as enjoyable. And also at the end of the piece, probably you noticed that I was uh, also trying to play something jazzy, something that um, lets the music breed. So I, I, I've, I've moved on from my snare pattern, um, which is very often played in, in Brazilian music, because that's a samba groove that I played. And the floor tom goes on a two, like one, kadoom, one, kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. So my groove was. With the normal sticks, it would be just too much. Mm -hmm. So I had to consider, okay, sound, sound choices, let's go with the brushes in the first time around. But because I had this, the big solo piece, which we're also going to talk about in a second, in the middle of, of this uh, song, at the end, it would be very difficult to change back to the brushes. So what I did was I moved on to the cymbals. And that, that's enough. You know, Sometimes it's enough. If, if, if there is someone playing a nice melody, you don't always have to play a full drum kit on right. full volume. Right. So sometimes you can choose elements of the kit that you want to use. For example, the right beat with some additional uh, hi hats. Also, the other thing that is very important that you can add your bass drum pattern, not on a full volume, because 
if you play in a rock volume, then it's, it's just going to stand out too much. So, so you got to sort of improve your foot technique to the level that you can play the same pattern on the same speed, but much quieter. Other thing you might have noticed is the left hand. Why did I change to the traditional grip? Now, the main thing about the traditional grip, first of all, 90-95% of the time I'm playing the match grip. I'm a match grip player. I have a sort of a mirror image setup, so this is my center point, and I'm moving with both hands to both directions, okay? Because the match grip is probably, we can state that this is better for moving around the kit. Now, for the uh, traditional grip, the big difference is that all the weight of the arm and I nicked it from Steve Smith, who has an, an amazing um, instructional video drumming technique out there. Uh, he explains the way that the weight of the arm is underneath the stick. And when you play match grip, then the, the entire weight of the arm is on the top of the stick, so you're naturally going to be more heavy-handed. Um, and there are certain sort of finger techniques and light um, touch techniques. You know, you mainly play with the thumb and the index finger, uh, middle finger here. You can play really nice buzzes and a couple of accents. Of course, you can play loud notes as well with rim shot and everything. But generally, my touch becomes softer, much lighter, more sort of um, musical in, in the way that um, I, I don't feel like I, I'm, I'm, I'm overpowering sure. Cornell's melody. So I automatically change to that when I play swing or something that is qu more quiet, like Latin stuff, samba, something like this. So these are a sort of natural reaction that, of course, I've, I've, I've practiced for a long time, you know, to play with the traditional grip. I started that maybe 20 years ago when I first saw the great um, uh, Joe Morello and he had a wonderful instructional video. And that was the time when I really started understanding that what is happening here with the motions and the fingers. So, but the reason why I'm using it, there's a musical reason behind it. So we, we mainly want to talk about music today here yep. and, and how to play together. Because, you know, suddenly I'm not alone behind my drum kit and playing as loud as I want because then I'm going to kill the music. And that's the very last thing you want to do, trust me. Okay, so, so I've changed my my patterns according to the melody. First, I went. With, uh, I played the, the first round with the with the brushes, and then uh, we had a conga solo section, um, which comes over a certain polyrhythm. Now, that polyrhythm we also like to break down, because I received a lot of questions about that mm. um, in my uh, in my first uh, drumming appearance, uh, which is uh, titled uh, "Percussive Drumming and Independence." Please check it out if you if you haven't seen it. Um, and there was a polyrhythm that I I, I broke down back then. Uh, which which I, I wrote a chart for, which we're going to record tomorrow for the for the course. Uh, for so for Drumio members, it's going to be it's right. going to be available, and that's a four over five polyrhythm, uh, which we play together. So I, I play a groove, uh, which is a, a simple paradiddle groove, right left right right left right left right between the hi hat and the snare drum, and what I'm playing is a five sixteen. Uh, polyrhythm against it on the left foot. Now, the, the 516 is a, is a very interesting rhythm because it comes back, it resolves on the one after five bars. So what, uh, another, another thing that is very important if you want to be a professional drummer, to be able to follow the form. Now, normally we have four, eight, 12, 16 bar uh, musical forms, uh, but this one is a five bar form. Okay, so it's a little bit more difficult, more advanced, and of course you want to finish the uh, uh, the section after four bars because that's what this is how you naturally feel it. But with the fives on the left foot, it's going to come back uh, after five bars. Okay, it's going to resolve after five bars. So what we're going to do is Cornet plays a solo. Uh, when we, we can probably count together. You can, you can count with us, you're going to show the bars. So one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, and one. Okay, so that's going to be the one. So he plays twice the five bar form uh, on the congas. And then he changes to this very, very special instrument. I don't know if we can show uh, a close-up from that instrument. This one is Cornell's invention. It's a ah, no very, way. very unique instrument. Yeah. Um, there's a musical reason for it, again. Uh, this one is called the Udu Kerry from Tycoon, which is a mixture of an, of an Udu and a Czech Kerry. So there's a hole on the top, like the bass hole, goom, goom, for the goom, goom sound. Really cool. Nice. So, so, so it's a, it's a mixture of an udu. There's a hole, and of course, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a normal checkery. Uh, so, it it sort of it's, it it works for both functions. And so, after um, 
twice the five bar section on the conga solo, Kun is gonna change to that. And that's where I stop playing the four four. So try to keep the four, okay? All the way through. It's all the way, all the way through it's, it's uh, in four four. But we have five bar sections. Okay, here we go. A one, two, three. So it's a, it's a little bit harder to keep because you have the dun dun gun gut bum bum the cat cat. So basically the polyrhythm is these are the quarter notes, yeah? Then one, two, three, four. One. You wanna help us counting? Yeah, I just wanna know what, what what are we looking for the students as to playing together as a percussionist on that section there? Because there's a lot. Now we're talking about a polyrhythm, there's so much going on. <laughs> yeah. uh, as a student trying to learn how to play with a percussionist, what was what was the key things to take out with that? Okay, now the key thing key, the key things, of course, this is a very complex piece. As, yeah. as, as you as you pointed out, sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's all but good. we can't help it. You know, this is this is how our, our brain works. You know, Cornell <laughs> has the same crazy ideas and I have the same crazy ideas. I mean, the, the reason why I first uh, sort of formed the band and approached Cornell with this is uh, um, because I wanted to play my crazy ideas more musically. So I thought, okay, who could really add to this, you know? Right. And uh, so, of course, Cornell's uh, uh, amazing technique and, and sound choices allowed us to, uh, to, to make my ideas more musical in the sense that we play them together. So basically what happens here, uh, what I'm trying to point out is the importance uh, to keep the form, because the form is very important, and of course, the sound, to get the, get the sound together. So probably you notice in the piece that when I had my solo part, I played the same parts much, much louder, much harder. Okay, so when Cornell comes in, of course, I had to drop the volume without slowing down, because that's the most natural thing that amateur drummers do. When, when they play a certain thing and then they, then they take the volume down, the tempo drops right. drastically. Yep. And when they come back up with a louder piece, they speed up back again. Right. So the tempo moves, okay? So it's a very important thing um, to keep the timekeeping, keeping the structure, and keeping the volume under control. Right. So, so these are, um, I, I would say, uh, probably th three of the most important elements right. that, that, we, um, uh, that we try to point out here. And the other thing is, of course, uh, being able to play uh, polyrhythmic uh, pieces together. Now, for example, when Cornell changed to the, uh, to the Czech array, uh, he played a five, uh, we play a 516 rhythm, which is one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, ta, 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 one, two, one, two, three, 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 that, 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 that. Now, for that, you really need to be able to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was another thing that we discussed before, that how important it is when you play together with someone to listen and react to what, what the other person plays, because suddenly you're not alone anymore. You're, right. yeah. yeah. Okay, so for that one, of course, timekeeping, the awareness of the musical period, which is five bar, uh, five, five, five times uh, four bars, and of course, being able to play the certain here and play the polyrhythms against it. So the hearing, the, the ear training is just as important as your technical chops. Now, Jojo Mayer told me back in the day that if you want to play fast, you need to hear fast. Okay, so it's, it's very important that you hear the different subdivisions and, and um, different polyrhythms or cross rhythms um, over a 4-4 four, four in order to, to be able to execute them together. Mm -hmm. Because if you lose the, the beat, uh, then, then the whole piece is going to fall, fall apart. Right. Okay, I'm not saying that the point is that the audience loses the beat, but who pl the, the person who plays it should never lose the beat. Right. Okay, so uh, let's just work out this rhythm together. What we're going to do is you'll your help us counting, All okay? Right, let's do it. You, and you'll count the 4-4, four, four, and we play the 5 16 Cornell on the check array, and I'm on the hi-hats, and we help you counting, okay? Okay. Okay, so you're going to count 4-4, four, four, five, 5 bars, okay? And then we hit the 1. Got it. And repeat, okay? Let's do it. 
Az ötös nyom. Exactly. Boom. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's a, um, that's a very cool part of them. Now that's just the five sixteen over the four four. You can start doing the same thing with threes. If that's the beat, then you can start. You can do the same thing with seven. I just I just want you to train sort of to hear the different um, odd time signatures and polyrhythms going against the four. You can do the same thing with nine. In this particular piece, we chose the five because that, that went really well with all the patterns that we're playing. And um, another thing that we wanted to um, point out about this um, um, uh, this piece, uh, it's titled Hung Samba, is Cornell's hand technique. Now, um, this is something that is very, very unique, and Cornell's um, always been a very extremely individual player. Now, he's invented this technique, which is uh, uh, totally individual and, and, and a very unique around the world. We've not really seen anybody playing this. Uh, it's, it started in the 70s when he's... Um, uh, basically, he's been just listening to the radio, and there was no instructional, there was no drumio in the 70s. There was no other instructional videos, nothing. And he was just trying to work out how those Indian players achieve that great speed. Now, the difference is that they play on the tabla with the fingers only. Mm -hmm. And Cornell was, um, uh, started experimenting with different techniques, and then he came about this, uh, this motion, which, which he's going to explain. It's very important, the hand position. Yeah, the hand position, yeah. And... The first time in in this in the outside. Uh, he plays it on the outside of his hands. Yes, and and this is the the start, the start uh, stroke. Yeah, so it's like almost like a backhand that you play when you play ping pong. But it's a crazy. A crazy motion. Yeah. <laughs> After it's, it's work and the, the other stroke in inside. Yeah. Outside, inside. Outside, inside. Yeah. When he plays the outside, he uses the nails of the fingers as well. Outside, inside. 
Unreal. I, I can see why, Cornell, you were voted the top percussionist in the world in <laughs> yeah. 2016. That's incredible. <laughs> I can probably keep it with him, like, <laughs> outside, inside. But it's already hurt. I know. <laughs> I couldn't do that. No way. Yeah. Now, very important thing, a couple of things ab about this technique that we, we wanted to share with you here is uh, it, it's Cornell's invention, and it, it, it came from, from the desire to achieve speed. Uh, because this way, uh, with like it, it's an extremely loose um, wrist motion, and also a bounce. Now, it's very important that he never leaves leaves the hand in there. It's like when the boxer, uh, you know, makes a punch. He never leaves the hand in there because that's the time when it really starts to hurt. Mm -hmm. yeah, so what you want to do is a quick attack and then pull the hand back. So that's what he does quickly. It's the outside and the inside. It's always a double stroke. So it goes like out in, out in, which is a, even more unbelievable yeah. than how he achieves that speed with it. But he certainly does somehow. And um, it's basically the same thing for us drummers that, uh, that I was also trying to point out in my last lesson. Is I never, on this on purpose, mm -hmm. I never leave the stick in the surface, whether it's a right symbol or snare drum. I, I never sort of... Um, sort of play into the drum or into the cymbal unless that's the sound you're after. Right. But, but generally, you should always try to play out, play off the surface, you know. Even the floor tom, you know, which is the, the loosest head on the whole kit, bounces the stick back all the way to me. So all, you, all, all your job is to allow the stick to come right. back to you. Right. Because if you play into that, that's the best way to hurt your hands, damage the drum head break the sticks, and, th and there's no point uh, doing that. Now, the other thing, similar to the sticks, which is an extreme advantage of, of this technique, is Cornell can play it on any surface. Because um, if you play with the, uh, with the regular uh, conga technique, uh, which is a palm down, uh, you ver very likely you're mostly going to use the congas, bongos, djembe, but he can play it on the cymbals as well because it, it comes back so quickly. He's going to demonstrate it just super quickly, the, uh, the advantages of this technique. <laughs> I would cut my hand if I did that. Yeah, <laughs> I, just, I know I would. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's just it's, it's it's the speed, and of course you try not to catch catch the edges, you know. But playing on the surface, so it's very important. So. Um, these, these are the, the most important elements, you know, that we, that we try to keep in mind uh, when we compose our music. Of course, the other thing that we do, um, there's nothing wrong with jamming because all about, you know, music for us is all about having fun and keep that enthusiasm uh, for music. I mean, I've been, you know, playing for 30 years. I started when I was 10 and this year I'm going to be <laughs> too many. <laughs> this year I'm going to be 40. I've been playing for 30 years and I enjoyed every single minute of doing right. this. That's so, good, yeah. So, so it, it's a wonderful thing. That's the joy of playing music, which you should always keep because that's the, that's the message here, you know, to share the love for music and uh, share our knowledge. And, um, so jamming is a very, very cool thing because you, you just have general fun with uh, playing with another person. But um, for us, we thought we were a little bit more organized if we create... Um, if we create certain compositions where, of course, the time signature changes, the mood, the sound, uh, the style is changing. Now, um, the other, th other thing that is equally important in our um, Thunder Duo music is the improvisation. Mm -hmm. So now how do we complement the yes. soloist? Yes. This is a very, very Good interesting question. thing. Yeah. Um, so, for example, in this piece, what you just heard, um, probably you noticed that uh, in the in Cornell solo section, of course, I, I lowered the, the volume. I kept the same pattern, but I lowered the volume. Now, very often when we improvise, uh, I, I just try to be a cushion. I just try to be uh, a soft blanket on the right. drum kit without being too harsh and too loud, just to give him um, space to play. And when my solo part comes, then I will play, you know, I will yeah. flash. So you don't always have to, to flash. Try to think about music. Try to think musically. This is our message. So we're just going to do a little improvisation where I play uh, with the mallets 
which is again another color that I use. Um, and Corn is just going to improvise over it. We have we have uh, this pattern that we play. This is in four four. It's going to be much easier, uh, much easier to follow. And it's inspired by a great groove uh, from Simon Phillips, who uh, was the drummer with with Toto at the time. And it's a brilliant groove that he, that he played on the Tambu album. And I'm just going to play that groove. We normally play this uh, this piece. Um, as part of our improvisational section in our clinics and performances. And Corny is just going to improvise. So you'll see how much room you can give a percussionist if you provide a solid foundation. Okay, so the groove would be something like this. Cool, yeah. So you just play a nice of the melody, nice of the rhythm, something that is soft, and also a very important thing that 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 happens in in jazz. I mean, you have you have a lot of choices. This is what I love in jazz and about sort of world music, in, in, improvised music, is that you have a lot of choices. And and there's something that I, I learned from Tony Williams, uh, the great Tony Williams, after reading one of his interviews, and. Um, he was talking about the choices he makes when he plays with Miles Davis. And, and basically he said something that you either follow him and repeat the rhythm or join him playing, say, a cross rhythm, a polyrhythm that he plays in a moment, or you play against it. You play something totally different, you know? So you have the choices that you make. Sometimes I, I go with him if he plays a polyrhythm and, and I try to repeat or just join in the flow, or sometimes I play something completely against it. So there's a, there's a lot of choices that, uh, that, that, that you can make, and that's the beauty of the music yeah you know. as long as you're thinking about it that way you're purposeful with what you're doing you're not just thinking just as a drummer right absolutely you guys are a duo now and yeah, yeah. absolutely and back to my point uh, which I made uh, it's very important and I think the hardest part in the improvised pieces or improvised sections is not to lose the beat because basically what he say for example if he was playing something like So you always need to have the awareness of the musical period and the beat, where the beat is, because if you risk that, it's, it, it happens very often, even with professional players as well, that they, they lose the original beat once they introduce a polyrhythm against it. Right. Okay, so that's when you have like real timing and, and polyrhythmic awareness of what's happening in the music. Love it. 
Yeah. There's a, so much inf- so much information is coming out right here. You, I'm going to have to watch this one a couple times. And, and what I love is just the fact that you're able to demonstrate and you can see. I mean, these guys have been playing together for 12 years. Yes. You know saying? So you guys know each other very well, but there's a lot of times you've probably played with other percussionists that you've never met before. Yeah. So you're constantly listening to them or you're, you're constantly just keeping an active ear for what's going on, right? Most importantly. Yeah, most importantly. And also the, the other thing, that the, the first point, just coming back to the first point that we made about the volume, that I was lucky enough um, I'm, not, I'm not a very loud drummer. I've never been a very loud drummer. But I was told from an early age that I'm being too loud. Mm-hmm. Particularly when I started playing in a jazz band. You know, Before I, I, I relocated to London over 10 years ago, I, I played in the Budapest Radio big band. And it was a jazz band. And you, 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 you cannot just play as loud as you can. You've got to be aware of the, of the room and the entire band and, and the volume, whether you play for a, for a recording, whether you play for a live session, whether you play open air or you play in a, in a classroom. You know, I, I see students, you know, playing like, like this, like Wembley Arena when they play in a, in a, in a 20 piece classroom, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so you, you need to be aware, so like to try to be an all round musician. That's, that's my message here. That's, that's what we're trying to do is to be aware of the circumstances, be aware of the other musicians, uh, be aware of the polyrhythms, be aware of the pulse, mm-hmm. Be aware of the timekeeping, the polyrhythms, everything that is happening in the music. Um, so with our next composition... Yeah, let's do it. We'd, like, we to, we'd like to demonstrate um, another very, very interesting thing, uh, which is, uh, often happens in fusion music or even Eastern, music, Eastern European folk music when people play in odd time signatures. Okay. okay. So this is again a, um, a, an interesting piece uh, that is titled uh, Transylvania Express. Okay. And uh, it features an odd time signature. We would love you to hear, I mean, it, it, actually two. Uh, we, we'd love to hear uh, your comments. Uh, um, guess the time signature. Guess the time signature. It's not that difficult at okay. all. So but there's you, two you, of them in here? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you're easily, you're easily going to get it. And, and then we break it down and we try to explain what's happened here. Okay. So enjoy Transylvania Express. All right.
<laughs> yes. That was yes. awesome. <laughs> Thank wow. You. Very well done. It's crazy how uh, engaging just two rhythmic players are. Well, thank you know, you. it's crazy. It's really cool. I can see how you guys have been doing it for 12 years. That's, that's it's awesome. Yeah. Transylvania Express, that one's called. Well, Transylvania Express, there's a lot to take in. There's a lot to talk about. If you guys guess the, uh, the time signature, then leave a comment below this video. We're not going to give it away. Okay. I want to see, see all the guesses down there and the okay. comments and, and all that. But uh, uh, very cool. Absolutely. How are your hands not bleeding? <laughs> Which is a basic question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's no idea. He just plays. I mean, yeah. it's un un unbelievable. I mean, I, if I hit like the drum twice uh, like, like that, I, I would break probably my fingers. So it's, it's a lifetime, you know. He's been playing percussion for like 30, 40 years. I mean, Cornell started out as a flute player. Mm. And I think that's one of the reasons why his playing is so melodic. Yeah. So I just, I just try to keep up with the speed, try to keep up with the great uh, rhythms that he plays. And um, as we discussed before, you know, what, what, what to take away uh, from this song? Now, uh, very important, I mean, I don't even know how, where to start because there's so many things to yeah. talk about. We, we've been talking about before trading force. Now, you guys probably spotted the section that we, we were um, sort of um, giving each other the room. Like I, I completely stopped and Cornel was playing eight bars in the given time signature, which I'm not going to tell you just now. Mm -hmm. At the end, we will. So <laughs> just to make sure that everybody knows. And uh, so we're just going to demonstrate that section. Now, it's very important that you keep the counting while the other player is soloing. Because, of course, we play a lot of polyrhythms, so it's easy to lose uh, the beat. So what we're going to do, a little bit slower at speed, we're going to demonstrate the solo section when Cornet plays on the djembe or the congas, whichever he chooses, because he, he keeps changing back and forth um, between. And, and then I'm going to play my little solo bit, which I'd like to also like to uh, break down to you. Um, so we're going to do the, the solo section. Cornell will start um, as, in the, as per in the composition, and I'm just going to try to keep um, the pulse happening here. It's very important. Of Okay, yeah. so um, that's one thing. Can we tell the time signature now or not yet? Yeah, let's do it. We got about five minutes left and we still got one more performance piece. So let's, yeah, we're running low on time. time oh, really? Yeah. Oh my God, I was going to talk about what? so many things. <laughs> Jesus. You know, we'll have to save that for the course. We are filming a full course with both of you guys uh, tomorrow, which is going to be available for Edge members. So just come to drumia.com when you're waiting for guys. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, uh, what's the time signatures? Let's okay. Do it. Let's give it away. Now, the time signatures are uh, the whole piece started out in 7 4. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that, that was my idea. I mean, th like many, many compositions of, of Thunder Duo, uh, the, the, core, the core idea of the 7 4, it came to me from a crazy idea of who's playing a cha cha in 7 4. You know, one of our, our, our um, favorite DVD was the Giovanni Hidalgo with Horacio Allegro uh, with 
totally loved them. Uh, the great players, and most of the stuff was in four uh, and and in, in Latin style. And we sort of started to give our flavor to it. So I, I had this crazy idea: why not play the uh, the cha cha rhythm in seven four? So basically, the melody is. <laughs> And then we have a figure. One, two. Here we enter uh, a double time feel, but we're still in seven. But instead of playing seven, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two. Now we're in seven, eight, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that was the, the sort of uh, uh, seven, eight clave that Cornell introduced in taka dimi taka de taka dimi taka de taka dimi taka. And I had the crazy idea that why not try to play that clave, the seven, eight clave on my left foot with the cowbell. So I added that, and of course, independently different uh, 16th note bass rhythms going. So I keep the 7-8 seven, uh, seven, clave. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1. Very slowly. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, 1. So that's a 7-8. There was another thing that I wanted to mention. I, I know we're running low on time, so I'll be quick. Uh, probably you notice that how much we keep an eye contact. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not just the, the, the listening. Of course, we're listening. But it's very important that you always set up on the stage that you can keep an eye contact with everybody in the band. Right. Because, for example, there's a lot of improvisation going on uh, in this piece, apart from the solo sections. So, th so basically, the bar numbers are open. So it's not like a set structure that this is always like that. No, we improvise and we go with the flow, with the, we go with the audience reaction, and, and then we give a cue. So normally in a professional um, music world, it would, it would be called like on cue. Like for example, the next section, it's either Cornell or IQ. Probably you notice during the performance that we give a hey sound or whatever. You, you look at each other and you acknowledge that you got the cue and that's when we change our patterns. So that's when the dunk 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 the sort of the um, polyrhythm, polyrhythmic end came which we played as a unison because it's very important that you don't miss the unisons yep. because if you miss the unisons that whole band's going to fall apart exactly so yeah. you need to know your part and you need to also be aware of what the other person's playing and if it's a unison try to play it as tight as possibly can absolutely Looking at each other is key. I saw you guys vocalizing to each other too, which is key. Um, we talked also about dynamics, keeping your volume low, orchestration, how you're choosing your patterns, giving each other space, obviously not stepping on each other's uh, toes when you're doing trading solos Very and all important. That. Very important. There's lots of great stuff in here, guys. We've got to cut it off because it's, it has been an hour, but we're going to get you to play us one more piece. I can't believe it's been an hour. I know. Well, I, it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for it's having been great us. great having you back. Guys, you got to check out Gabor's other lesson if you like this, and if you guys are coming from the other lesson because you liked Gabor and you're watching this one, thank you. Uh, also, we're doing a whole course with Gabor and Cornell called Building Rhythmic Tension, and we're going to have a lot more stuff on here. Plus, tomorrow we're going to be live for free with everyone on Facebook and YouTube and everything like that. Um, we're going to just have a performance hour with Thunder Duo. There's going to be no teaching. It's just going to be nothing but nothing playing, but playing yeah. which is going to be really cool. Uh, so come and hang out with us for, for that. And um, for those watching here live right now, thanks for joining us. If you like what you see, come to drumio.com. I mean, we have a lot of great 
great videos like this. And every time we bring special guests out like Gabor and the Thunder Duo, we always do some exclusive courses and material, which is the best stuff we film, in my opinion. And that goes into the members section. So, um, yes, thank you both. Thank Gabor. you for having us. Cornell, thank you so oh, much. Okay. <laughs> and uh, what are you going to play us out with? Yes, this is one of our oldest composition, which again feature and uh, some odd time signatures and some polyrhythms against the odd time signatures, and also it's going to feature uh, some vocal percussion. So it's like a a, a multi layer um, multi layer piece, uh, which is titled Attack Tom. And it also features uh, different world elements. Like, for example, it starts with a Bulgarian rhythm and then it goes into, as someone refers to it as Indian style or canical um, uh, singing. Um, so hope you're going to enjoy. Please make sure to check out Dramio. Make sure to check out thunderduo.com and enjoy the next piece. Tak Tom. Absolutely. Hey, and if you guys need a, a shaker... Yeah. In your band? You yeah. could be the Thunder Trio? <laughs> thunder, thunder Trio. Yeah. Oh, no. I can play the triangle. That's right. <laughs> the cowbell. Right. See you guys all later. Take yeah. it away, guys. Here we go. Don't, 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 don't,